on a lonely planet slowly spinning its way to damnation, amid the incompetence and unpreparedness of lesser space programs, one team stands resilient against the herds, putting their lives on the line to aid those who were previously unaware of the quick save option. Yes, it's the incredible adventures of Jebediah and his crack team of Kerbinauts. They are the Blunderbirds. Saving the Kerbin race one stranded explorer at a time. Hello everyone and welcome to today's KSP video which marks the second episode of The Blunderbirds, a series in which I rescue other players' blundered missions. In today's episode we're going to be saving Jebediah who has been stranded here on the Mun by Reddit user Kinrail. While this was his first Mun landing and therefore quite the achievement, we cannot let Jebediah be abandoned without hope on the Moonar surface. And so at the KSC, which I had to fully upgrade for this mission, Blunderbird 2 is readied for deployment. This aircraft boasts a four crew capacity with a sizeable cargo hold, making it fairly analogous to the actual Thunderbird 2, which is from a TV show called Thunderbirds that was clearly inspired by my Blunderbird series. Now, we can see it here all in its majestic glory, and we can do that nice cinematic zoom out, get the UI up and throttle up, turn on SAS and get this thing moving. So it's packing quite a number of rapiers actually. Some of you may see the similarities between this and my Besant SSTO which was used uh, to launch the first module of the Collaboration Station in the series Collaboration Station in, <laughs> in which me and a bunch of other YouTubers kind of built a space station around the Mun. So this is slightly lighter, the cargo bay isn't quite as big but for this mission it doesn't really need to be as big. So our flight path uh, follows the fairly standard affair of accelerating to around 430 meters per second at lower altitudes before beginning to increase our pitch and accelerating our way to orbit. There is a link to the craft in the description if you're interested, as well as a link to the music video version of this video, which is a non-profit video, so it doesn't really affect me if you watch it or not, but I really like the way it came out, so if you want to watch that at the end, it'll be on, on the screen. A lot of people in the comments of my Space Shuttle video were complaining about how I don't make music videos anymore. I do, they just, they just I get blocked or muted, and so I don't like having them as the, the main video now, because it's kind of disheartening to see videos you worked really hard on uh, get blocked. <coughs> yes. As well as the Craft File and Music Video link, there are also links to my Twitter and Discord server, so if you like that sort of thing, then those are sorts of things that you will like. <laughs> and there you are, you might have heard the audio cue or just seen the flames change, but here we are, firing the rapiers into their closed cycle mode to really increase our speed. We're going to save about 420 ish meter, um, meters per second, 420 ish units of oxidizer left in that tank just to help us accelerate off the mun and to help us land on the mun because although this thing does have the thrust to weight ratio to land purely on the nuclear engines, I'm far too impatient for that uh, and so I ended up needing to use needless oxidizer. But you know, this thing works, I mean look how much fuel we've got, what is that, 5,000, basically almost 50, well it's going to go down actually a little bit, but about 5,200 meters per second of fuel left in this thing's, um, left in this thing's fuel tanks, which actually gives it enough fuel to do an ELU landing and return, or a lathe landing and return, so, you know, we, we clearly have excess fuel when, we, when it comes to doing a MUN landing, but we probably will be using a lot of excess fuel just to fine-tune our landing. You can do moon landing sort of accurately without expending excess fuel, but if you're like me and just end up brute forcing it and don't really like, you know, calculating these sorts of things too thoroughly, then it's nice to have that bit of wiggle room. And also, I like it if, you know, if you're downloading this craft file from the description, you'll know that you definitely have enough fuel to kind of you know, help your way through missions if you're not as experienced at flying SSTOs as someone like me. Uh, so we are doing our uh, burn towards the Mun. We raised our periapsis to about 85 kilometers around Kerbin, so we have enough wiggle rooms that we're not going to dip ourselves into orbit, although we didn't really end up descending too much. Uh, it probably would have been more efficient, well it definitely would have been more efficient to do this burn over two orbits, but again, fuel efficiency isn't as important here because this thing has excess fuel capacity really for what it needs to do and it was just it was just I was just lazy really and I wanted to keep this we're keeping the length of the video a little bit shorter by doing it in one burn we do have a slight slant to our orbit though so we can do a correction maneuver sort of on on our way just to help ourselves get into an equatorial orbit although actually I didn't realize at the time because I, I didn't look <laughs> but um Jeb's capsule is actually not like an equatorial orbit won't pass over Jebedar's capsule so we will end up needing to tweak ourselves back into a slanted orbit later on. So, good job there. <laughs> okay, so I kind of was talking all the way through that burn, but here we are arriving at the moon. 
pointing ourselves retrograde, of course. Setting up, I set up a maneuver node just to give us an idea of how long the burn would be. Two minutes, just over two minutes, isn't that long a time. So, you know, being accurate wasn't too too much of an issue really. Not that it would be anyway. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know how to play this game. So our, our orbit's quite high here because our um our periapsis over the moon was quite high. So we want our orbit to be a little bit lower than that. So we're just gonna. Lower our periapsis so we're not in quite a circular orbit so we can swoop down and then burn at periapsis to bring our apoapsis down. I feel like that didn't make a lot of sense as I was listening to it back, but we're going with it. I, I, I'm too lazy for retakes. And Jebediah steps out of his capsule as he hears the roar of the Blunderbird engines above and realises that rescue is close. And yes, he can hear in space because, you know, he's Jebediah Kerman, my friends. So... What we're going to do is we're switching to Debbie Dyer and just so he's on the light side of the planet. Not only to make it easier for me to see what I'm doing, but also just so you can see what's easier. I have to make a conscious effort of making my videos look a little bit more glowy and bright when I'm recording them and editing them because YouTube just squashes all the blacks and things. And that's a, that's not a racist term, by the way. Google's not a racist company. But uh, yeah, it makes all the blacks very, very black and everything gets darker is what I'm trying to say here. So... Um, landing on the light hand side and trying to do as many maneuvers as possible on the lighter side of planets uh just this is something i try and do so i actually can do the ambient light adjustment in the difficulty settings menu no just the settings menu because i'm playing in 1.3 finally now all the mods i want have been updated except for planet shine um i can now play it in ksp 1.3 um so i'm using stock ground enhancements i think that's what the name of the mod is which is why it's unfortunately quite hard to see things on the map screen for the mun didn't realize till um after i started filming this that that was going to be an issue so sorry if you can't see it i tried right clicking them so you could see you know whereabouts they are relative to each other but luckily this video is played at sort of four times the speed anyway so it shouldn't be too long without like shouldn't have to go too long not knowing what it is you're looking at so yeah kicking some of the rapiers there as i realized i was coming towards the ground way too fast i spent a lot of time adjusting my normal and anti-normal relative to jeb rather than you know bleeding off my vertical speed but it didn't matter so we're actually going to keep landing at this sort of angle here playing back at normal speed now to give you a sense of how fast i was going when i hit the ground so yeah i bounced a bit but luckily this thing has huge wheels well it has the large wheel at the front the extra large wheels at the back and then just the medium wheels underneath the um underneath the engines just to provide a bit of stability when landing because the eagle-eyed among you apparently people say i say that a lot but whatever the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that those rear wheels weren't there at the beginning of the video that's because when i launch this thing if they're deployed it can't really get off the ground unless it does that sort of ski jump uh, at the end of the runway whereas if they're retracted then the center of mass is pretty much more or less where those extra large wheels are so we can easily get off the ground and pitch up while still on the runway so it doesn't need to do the the ski jump thing that a lot of sstos have to do um but yeah when it when you're trying to land on the mun and indeed when you're landing on kerbin it makes a lot more sense to have them deploy just because if the ship rocks or tilts um the engines won't be the thing that takes the load <laughs> So yeah, Jebediah can embark from his lander and excitedly runs towards Blunderbird 2, grabs the ladder, climbs the ladder, and prepares to board the capsule. But he can't, because the capsule is full, because we brought four Kerbals with us. So what are we to do? Well, the first thing we can do is Bill can jump out, break his neck on the floor by the looks of things, and plant our blunderbirds flag because of course we do but we can't just leave bill stranded and then just have an endless cycle of sending blunderbird 2 to rescue a kerbal but then abandon another one on the surface so this is where blunderbird 2's secret feature comes in i say secret feature like it's a secret but i mean i talked about it at the beginning of the video but we can actually open the cargo bay that it has on board so just to protect the solar panels and communications antenna, which is going to retract those. Open up the cargo bay, which I abound to action group 5, as well as the onboard lights. And we're actually going to land the lander inside the um, the SSTO. The Blunderbird. I forgot the name of it. Of course I did. So I actually um, measured out kind of the dimensions of the lander. So we have that sort of surface platform inside so that it will be exactly the right height for the junior docking port when it rests upon those those steel plates doesn't help that i completely missed uh, messed up the alignment of the docking ports though so we can just use the onboard promoter propellant inside this thing just to scoot it back 
realign it and then scoot forwards again now this did have a little bit of fuel left which is how i was able to do it but it was only about 140 meters per second excluding the 500 that jebediah would have in his eva pack and the monopropellant in the tanks but i don't think there was really enough to actually get it back into orbit i didn't really how much how much delta v do you need to get off the man i'm just glancing over to my delta v map i have taped to my wardrobe how much do you need 580 okay so this thing actually might have had enough fuel to get into orbit if we use jebediah's eva pack but whatever you know that's not important we, this was a cool mission guys <laughs> oh wait no that's that's not the mun okay no no it, it takes it takes it takes 870 to get into orbit so we're fine we're fine guys we're fine <laughs> Close save there, close save there. Okay, so we're going to throttle up the nuclear engines. Luckily, we've actually landed near this sort of ramp shape, you know, the slope that goes up to this big crater we're next to. So we have a nice sort of ski jump place to use to kick off from. Uh, I guess it would have been a good idea maybe to retract that rear landing gear, but I suppose actually, no, we're shaking about a bit. Ignore that. So we are kicking off from the side. Bit of a weird angle. Luckily, we have some RCS thrusters just to help us do some lateral control. Didn't even need rapiers, and we nearly hit the cliff edge and just grazed it there. You can see the actual shadow of the ship inches away from us. Um, but yeah, I planned that. I calculated that. I used trigonometry, worked out our distance and our hypotenuse, and I, I, I calculated all of that. So don't worry, it was never any issue. I think I got away with that. Okay, so we, I just wanted to demonstrate that you don't need uh, oxidizer to get this thing off the surface of the MUN. Oh, camera angle just freaking out there. Uh, you don't need oxidizer just to get off the surface of the MUN, but I would recommend you do so because you might not be fortunate enough to land where you have a big ramp there. Now, some of you may be criticizing, uh, criticizing that act, saying, Matt, you careless cosmonaut, you launched it directly backwards, which is, you know, the exact most inefficient way of getting into orbit. And yes, you are right, it is more efficient to launch, you know, with the planet or moon's rotation which is 90 degrees uh, on the nav ball in Kerbal Space Program but like I say at the beginning we have way too much fuel in this thing for a MUN mission or well, like too much is the wrong word we have we have excessive fuel for a MUN mission so we don't need to be efficient and just because uh, launching the other way would have meant we were going down a slope rather than up a slope it would have been a lot harder although I did just I did test I mean well we I didn't test it but I mean this thing could definitely have taken off because we could have used rapiers to get that extra kick Oh, whatever, that's that's why. But I know someone's going to point out, unless I mention it, so I'll just mention it now. So we're going to do some aero brakes again. Uh, we have about 2,000 meters per second of delta V just under. So, I mean, we didn't need to do our entire uh, lowering of our apoapsis using aero brakes, but I just decided we would. So we went for 50 uh, kilometers above Kerbin, which is generally a safe altitude when you're coming down from the MUN. Uh, we probably could have gone a little bit lower, to be honest, because the temperature gauge has never really got to the real dangerous you know, scale of red. In fact, we're not getting any show up there at all. Um, for the record, this is played on 100% re-entry heating, just in case you're wondering. I do, especially with Blunderbirds videos, I do always check the difficulty settings and things because it's not my save file. So people might, I think, was the Val mission played at reduced re-entry heating? I don't know, but um, I'd made sure I'd change all the difficulty settings to be normal values but for when it comes to filming these things. So yeah, we're doing a few air breaks. We're at an apoapsis height of now 328,000 meters, so we're not far off. We should be able to do it in just one more air break. So we're going to be a little bit more conservative in the way we're going to not pointing directly radial out because we don't want to have bleed off too much speed here because we'll end up dipping our apoapsis below uh, the Kármán line. And obviously we want to get back to the Kerbal Space Center, which will require us being in an equatorial orbit to get our, you know, um, trajectory set up nice and accurately. So we're going to do some, you know, oscillate, alternating between pointing prograde and then sort of pointing up or rolling. And we've managed to get an apoapsis of 72,000 meters, which is ideal. So we can just point our, get to our apoapsis point, do a quick burn of 54 meters per second, which, you know, we have well over a thousand meters per second of delta V remaining. So we have loads and loads of fuel. Before time accelerating round, making sure the Kerbal Space Center is in the daytime side of the planet. Just again, for your viewing pleasure and again, to make it a little bit easier for me. And, um... And yeah, then we're going to line ourselves up to Kerbin. Now, a lot of people ask me what mods I use. I did touch on it earlier when we were coming up to the moon. 
but that was the stock visual terrain enhancer thing i probably should have looked at the name of that but the actual other visual mods are scatterer is the big one that does the cool oceans and just the general atmospheric scatter as well as environmental visual enhancements using the stock con well not the stock combi cars but the convict files it comes with so boulder co i think that's what it's called we also have kerbal engineer that's the big readouts at the top we have better time warp uh, vessel mover camera tools hyper edit uh, hyper edit's great just for testing out vessels that's what i used to test this thing just to make sure it was able to get off the mud and you know wouldn't crash so that's why i confirmed it could take off from a flat surface using hyper edit although that wasn't from the exact place that the lander was that we rescued but you know i digress uh, that's what that big h is then and obviously vessel mover as well is great for testing things uh, <laughs> yeah make sure we activate those air intakes to get our actual rapiers firing again on air breathing mode obviously for when it comes to vessel mover and hyper edit obviously those aren't used during the actual mission i recommended hyper edit actually in my ss2 tutorial just for when you're testing it to see if it's stable in flight what i like to do is just drain or like get it into the air turn on infinite fuel in the cheats menu and just drain the fuel really quickly using hyper edit just so you have to do don't have to do it manually in the space plane hangar and just save a bunch of time just for testing it to make sure it's still stable when the fuel is empty uh, our fuel isn't quite empty so we had to pump a little bit forwards for this last bit just to make sure we didn't start flipping backwards and there we are touching down and that pretty much wraps this mission up so i, I hope you enjoyed uh, this next this this new installment of the blunderbird series um uh, yeah leave any comments suggestions or anything down below actually i feel like there's there's still more footage to talk over whilst we're slowing down nah i think we're I think we're fine i think we're fine so as mentioned earlier, I highly recommend checking out the music video version of this mission. I was really proud of the way it turned out. Uh, it's a great song as well. If you disagree, you're just objectively wrong. That video is on the top left of the screen now. Top right is a video in which I fly an SSTO to Elu, and that SSTO has uh, a lesser range than this craft here. So if you want to take this somewhere further out, you can watch that video as a guide. And then bottom right was just specially selected by YouTube's algorithm just for you. So other than that, thank you for watching this video.